It's all about Knight Rider. When I have the huge pleasure of continuing my talk with uh, a Knight Rider producer and writer, Tom Green. Uh, I don't know if you saw the first uh, part of this interview, but today we'll continue talking about Knight Rider as a show. Uh, we'll talk more about the characters. So uh, I hope you enjoy all the memories of uh, Knight Rider producer and writer, Tom Green. Okay, so so your your role as a producer, uh, um, among other things, uh, was to keep the integrity of the show, enlighten us a bit, a bit about the thoughts about how Night Rider should evolve as a show. Also, of course, the main characters. Um, any other thoughts during your time on on the show? I was a bit concerned about one thing, which was, and there were little bits of it that that we snuck out. And that Larson didn't do it. I, I wrote many Bibles, and of course, you know, Bibles are on shows. Yeah. My Bibles sometimes were, you know, 60, 70 pages, and it would be on everything. The look of the show, this but most important, which a lot of actors and features and stuff who do stuff, uh, the older actors do this, they will write elaborate backstories about who the character is, where they're born, where they, things that happened to them in their youth, where they went to school, accidents they've had, bad things they've done, good things, people they loved, things they lost, you know. None of it is ever used, but it does create it. And when I would do Bibles, add a lot of Bibles, and still, for all your characters, will write very strong backstories, and it helps you. Now, we end up doing superficial things, which we always have the ex-girlfriend who comes back into your life. We even did one with Devin's old girlfriend, if you remember. Yeah. Uh, well, you want to make it even more um, significant. And uh, the thing that concerned me on the show was, obviously, the whole show is predicated on a little bit of the backstory of Michael Long and Michael Knight. But you didn't really know what was Michael Long. Now, there also was a show, of course, where somebody recognized, oh, knows that Michael Long isn't really dead, and now he's Michael Knight. And now he's gonna... These are great stories, but they're the obvious. But when it, we didn't really go deeper uh, it, with him, Devin, we virtually, we didn't do it. And her, we didn't do it. And those were really, you know, the three main characters. We didn't go into who they were. And that bothered me a little bit because then when you invent things, for example, uh, there's a story that I tell. And so I, I won't be telling it again here. And everyone can go to on YouTube, of course. And if you just put in my name, Tom Green, G-R-E-N-E, Knight Rider speech, it's, it's where you, I think, saw me. Uh, you'll see my keynote speech for a huge convention in London, and in it, because sadly Edward Mulhair had passed away around that time, they did ask me to to tell an Edward Mulhair story. I have another one I could tell you guys, which I absolutely love, but that's that story about the motorcycle, and if you know that, and I'm very proud of that, and with, oh, I can't hold it. Uh, Edward, as you know, was a Shakespearean actor and a Broadway actor, and he was actually sort of known also as sort of the, what we call, bus and truck um, Henry Higgins from My Fair Lady. Of course, um, Rex Harrison was the Henry Higgins, but what happened was is that um, Edward Mulhair uh, sort of took on the slightly, well, he did do Broadway, he did do Europe of, of Henry Higgins, and but he also did a lot of Shakespeare, he did a lot of other, other movies that go way, way back, uh, and of course, um, most of us remember him from uh, the uh, Ghost and Mrs. Muir, you might have remembered him from that, and Our Man Flint, which was one of my favorites. I liked Edward a lot, but Edward was someone who I think felt that in some ways Knight Rider was just a little bit beneath him. And not that he didn't adore everyone on the show, and I'm not just saying this, this is, and not that he wasn't a consummate pro, but it wasn't about the show or the fact that you had a talking car or that it was television, which he had no problem doing. He felt that his job, and he was right in many cases, was basically to be the expository king. I mean, he's the guy who came in and said things like, you know, well, you know, there's a young woman, and she has been kidnapped by the Venetian um, executors, and uh, it's your job to find her and bring her back before the bomb blows off in Afghanistan. Uh, you will be meeting a man named, you know, and it was that kind of stuff, and it's just dull, dull, dull kinds of things. And he was getting kind of upset about that. Uh, and he had just done like four shows in a row in which his only job was to do this long expository things behind his desk. And he wanted to do more. 
And there's a show that we did called Speed Demons. And Speed Demons was filled with a plethora of problems um, and uh, just personality problems and the fact that it actually originally it was going to be a um, spin-off. And then it was and it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't. That always has a problem. Uh, it was directed by a magnificent director who was just kind of coming back named Bruce Green, no relation to me, who I used many times after that. And I still consider he and another director named Harvey Laidman, uh, who also did Night Riders uh, and every other show I've ever done, to be probably the two best TV directors around. And poor Bruce had to deal with this show, but because it was going to be and then not and then was, then not, uh, a spinoff, it had to keep changing and changing. And, you know, a director, and Bruce was an enormously uh, prepared director. And he would go home at night and take um, uh, notes and come in in the morning, and everything he had done he'd have to throw out because we'd keep changing it. In Speed Demons, there was a scene near the end, a cute scene, because Speed Demons had to do with dirt bike racing and a... Uh, um, a murder and a possible murder and the, the, the fun of it was if you might have remembered is Kit ends up on the track with the speed racers at the end. But at the very end of the tag you have to do your cute scene and uh, Edward Mulhair as his character was supposed to go on a motorcycle uh, you know because uh, he mentioned something about the fact that he used to do motorcycle riding. No one realized that Edward Mulhair the truth of the fact is he was absolutely and completely and totally terrified of motorcycles. Riding them, watching them, seeing them, show him a picture of one, he'd scream, but uh, he hated motorcycles, especially riding them. And he refused to ride the motorcycle. And it was imperative at the end that we have this scene where he rides off on the motorcycle. That was the whole point of the tag. And he did something which he had never done before. I think he was just upset about a lot of things. He went into his dressing room and slammed the door. And poor Bruce Green, uh, and this was actually one of the very first scenes we shot, is suddenly um, stuck because the actor won't come out. This is a director's nightmare, especially when a director is, is younger and, and starting out, or any director really, and that's when the actor goes in their dressing room and locks the door and won't come out because, of course, time is ticking away, and at the end of the day, when you don't get the shot and you're behind schedule, they don't say, well, the actor was sitting in their dressing room pouting. They say the director's not doing their job and they can get fired. So he came to me, Bruce did, and said, is there anything you can do? So I didn't want to go in first and several other people went in had no luck with him and I realized I had to use some psychology and I had to understand where Edward was coming from so I did something I, that I thought was interesting which is I addressed it straightforward and I think terrified the hell out of him and I think that's what worked and that was I walked in I said you know Edward I know why you're sitting here angry and I am on your side I think you should stay here and he went no. He said, yes, I, I think that what's happening right now with you is that you are wasting a great talent. It is true that you're spending all of your time doing these expository scenes. I've seen you on so many of the things, and you are so much better than that. And I, I, think, I, not, I even think not only should you sit in your dressing room, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do for you. I was a child actor. Not big, not like you, but I did a couple of things. And I was doing some junky little show or something in Gambier, Ohio. And I remember you were doing a road show of, of My Fair Lady and Henry Higgins. And I saw you in some small little theater doing this show, doing Higgins. I got to tell you, you're Henry Higgins. Rex Harrison is nothing. He's trash. He's garbage next to you. This is what you should be doing. You should be going from one small town to another. I know you're making big money on this show, and I know those shows you make, you know, 500 a week, whatever, but it's about the art, isn't it, Edward? It's about what you are and who you are. Not a man who sits behind a desk and tells Michael you must do this and that, but that you should be somebody who does what he believes in the hell with the money, even if you do it for free. So I'm telling you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the tower, to the executives, right now, and I'm going to say, I think we're unfair to Edward, and I think we, we should absolutely release him from his contract. Edward looked at me. What? You, what? He said, yeah. I don't think you should be doing the show anymore. You're too good, Edward. You're too good to be doing this. You should be doing uh, My Fair Lady 600 performances a year all over the country in tiny little towns for 500 a week. Nah, 
not here having to come in two days a week, spew some garbage that I write or someone else writes some junk and getting nothing. I, what, what are you making, 25, 50,000 an episode? I, what is that? That's nothing. It's not the money, Edward. I'm going to go. Well, yeah, wait a minute. He says, oh, hold on. What do you mean? <laughs> you, you know, young man, you don't need to, to get so upset about this. I just, there's a few things. I thought maybe, you know, somebody could get a double to have me shoot. Or I don't really need that. I said, no, no, Edward. It's not about that. It's more than that. You need to be, be who you are. And I started to walk out the door, and he said, oh, Tom, please, let me, let me, you can't be serious. Don't go up there. I, 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 maybe, maybe I'm being a little rash. I said, you are not being rash. You are being what you should be. And at times, you've got to stand up. I'm going there. I'm releasing you. We're going to call your agent. We're going to get you back out there on those little shows. I walked out the door. Edward comes right out and goes, Dear sir, please, have you no decency? Stop! Which, of course, I did, and came back, and... He uh, <laughs> kind of fell back on the stairs and took his breath. And I said, are you sure? Yes, yes, it's fine, it's fine. He ran in. Within a second, he's out wearing his helmet, uh, motorcycle helmet, which he had thrown out, you know, in anger before. Goes on the set and says, oh, Bruce, young man, let's, uh, let's get this over with right now. And jumped on the motorcycle. And if you see the scene, uh, watch it carefully. You will see that although he does the scene, he is terrified and terribly feeling uncomfortable. But that's the lovely Edward Moher, and uh, I've always been proud of that. And I will say that after that, we were very careful to give him really nice parts. If you but um, I even think I mentioned it in that, that there, and I think Return to Goliath, I think it was where they end up in, in jail together. He talks about how he was, you know, basically an MI1 or whatever. He was in like the secret, the James Bond secret yeah. service, yeah. and that he has a thing and to get them out called spies bread. And he's able to take, you know, the stays of his shirt and uh, the filament and this and that, and he mixes it together and some, it becomes like a plastic explosive and they're able to blow themselves out. And he talks a little bit about his days when he was, you know, in, in that. And yeah, as you know, I wrote that after because for him to give him more to do. So he's not just behind the desk always saying, well, when I was a has been kidnapped, I with a He hated doing that. But uh, but it was wonderful because then I didn't realize it, that Edward Mall here had, had experience somewhat like that. And we had lunch ones, and I was and we never got to use it, but he was telling me all these stories. And I just think it would have made the Devin character. He reminded me a little bit of years ago, there was a show called Man from Uncle. When I was a tiny kid, it was my favorite show. And Waverly something uh, was Leo G. Carroll played the Demon character, and he was the one who gave um, uh, Kiriakin and Napoleon Solo uh, their assignments. But being Leo G. Carroll, he always prefaced it by something in his past life or something he had done, which always made his character so wonderful. So that was uh, 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 you know something that bothered us a lot, um, and we needed. You know, and and I think kind of superficially the show. The, and why you say, well, why did you just create it? In those days, the sad part was, if we were to have developed a backstory, let's say for Deb the Devon character, we would have had to have sent that and submitted the, even though it's never used, the backstory to the network. And we had learned all of us from past experience that if you tried to create a backstory of a character that's concur that's currently on a show, they drive you absolutely crazy. You know, and for for whatever reason, so yeah, so that was, you know, that was a a, a concern on that. Yeah, I, I think you asked me something about uh, you were asked about Glenn Larson. Yeah, yeah, Glenn Larson. Um, there there is a lot to say. I had I I met him maybe three times. Uh, you know, he, he gets credit for you know developing amazing television. And at one time at Universal, he broke the record. I believe in one season, he had four shows picked up. He had, I think one was called Auto Man, Wolfen, Masquerade, and something else. He had all, all of them were terrible and they all bombed, but, you know, he could get anything done. Uh, I wasn't, you know, I'll just be really honest. I, he wasn't a bad guy. I didn't get to know him enough to know anything about him, but I was not a fan of him he was in my case and people around him he was not a friendly man um we would do conventions he knew who i was he you know we we did all these 
And he wouldn't even acknowledge my existence. Not that he had anything against me and not that it was an anger, but, you know, he just, that was his focus. He just wasn't into, you know, that kind of thing. He did something kind of interesting and, and very much, uh, oh, you know, he did. But he looked at his shows, Alias Smith and Jones, was a complete ripoff of Butch Cassidy. Needless to say, we know what Battlestar Galactica was. You know, and if you go to his shows, what he would do is he would take a show. As a matter of fact, Knight Rider, if you know the story of that, they had to pay George Romero, I think is his name, who did a motorcycle show called Knight Rider. Yeah, and a feature film. Feature film. Yeah. Yeah. And they were sort of like medieval, there was in modern day, but they were like medieval uh, you know, warriors. And the, uh, yeah. and the I'm sure this is what it was, the billboard uh, for that show, when you came off that two hours ago, when I talked about that entrance to Universal, on the outside, the billboard was for that, Knight Rider. And it's no coincidence that he ended up using Knight Rider. And and I think it was spelled the same. I could be wrong, I, you know, because they were the knights of like whatever. So, and Universal ended up paying Romero, you know, substantial money because he was suing them. You can't sue for a title, but there was some kind of quirky thing in there that he was able to do. But the one thing he did, which was really interesting, this is somewhat of a prophetic, although people are uh, not prophetic, but... Um, um, said, but people who knew him very, very well told me he worked really hard on his earlier shows. And there was a, um, actually it's where we shot that last scene with Devin in Speed Demons, where I told you where he wouldn't use the motorcycle. Yeah. And I forgot her name. She was a fame Garland, Beverly Garland was a, an actress and she had a hotel near Universal called the Garland Hotel. And that's where we shot that sequence he had a room a permanent room there and sometimes he was because he didn't want to go all the way home where he lived well now we're talking about in 1982 or, or even before that first shows 1980 he had done all these shows before and basically there were the same plots all the time and this is you know we used uh things called typewriters back then which is a whole nother story you know there were no computers but he used a computer a commodore i think or a k-pro but he also had this this thing which was way way over the top of of futuristic and he could feed a script page into it and they had them now but this is and it would read the print and convert it to digital and convert it to word so that all he had to do was he would take old old scripts feed it in there put it in the computer replace the character names and a couple of other things, and then repeat this new screen for his new show. You know, that was the kind of thing he did. But he, um, as I said, uh, uh, I never, he, you know, for whatever reason, had, in my experience, and I was very involved in the show, he had nothing to do with the production of the show at all. Uh, but, but, as I say, unlike Bangdon P.I., that was his baby. I mean, he, he came up with it, he created it, you know, in the beginning, um, you know, I think worked with Bob Senator for a while on it, so you give him credit for that. But um, he was a, I don't know, last thing I would say about him, and this is just purely my own opinion, there seemed to be, he was a massively successful person, and deservedly so. I mean, you know, when you look at his track record and what he did, and his shows, you know, near the end his shows weren't, but, you know, he had huge hits on his shows. But I, I found something kind of unhappy about him, and I don't know what it was. You know, as a person, but God love him. I mean, he he gave God and it, it outwardly gave God us all work. So God love him for that. Um, anyway, um, the uh, the thing it's so funny when you talk about typewriters, which I think I may have mentioned my other thing. I have an assistant now. She's twenty eight, so she's not a child, and she was going through some stuff in my storage area, looking for things, and she came across a. Um, Selectric typewriter that was all bagged in there. And did you know she didn't know what it was? Mm. No. You know, she said, What is this? How does this work? And it was, you know, now I will say maybe if it was the old style typewriter that you could still see in movies, which is the first my dad had was when I first went to Universal, I used my dad's he wrote longhand, but my mom would type up his scripts and it was a typewriter that was made in uh, nineteen thirty two. Yeah, and I brought it to the studio. 
she didn't know because the, if you remember, the Selectrics had a ball in the middle. Yeah. So we had no idea what it was. But we used to use um, typewriters back then. And uh, then, we'll, but the thing about making changes, you talk about writing, you know, it's funny because in computers now we have things called cut and paste. Yeah. Is, yeah. This expression was well, because we literally would take a page and if we had a scene we like, we would really cut that scene and then we would paste it further down, you know, and then staple on. And then if we we're adding or changing dialogue, we would draw these like little, like in cartoons, you have these little balloons and then you have the dot. On, yeah. We'd literally on balloon, put the dog, you get an arrow and say, this goes here. It was really kind of funny. <laughs> uh, but I have it. Um, I don't. I, I would love to see studies on this because there was something about the permanency that when you had to put paper into a typewriter and you had to write, made you think differently. Made you think yeah. more. And now things are, you know, you can just put stuff in, change, 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 change. Uh, I don't know, and I don't know if it's better. Because that was fun. Now, my my uh, my, my kids were when they saw the, uh, a typewriter, they said, "Well, that's interesting. It, it prints while you write." <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was blown away. I could, and could and I even remember I had a girlfriend and came down to my office at home and I was typing something, and I had this electric then that had that white tape and your backspace, and it, it would take lift. Yeah. That it was off. Yeah. Yeah. And to the point where I could go without purpose and then go, and it would go, it would just disappear on the page. Yeah. You know, I do that quickly. I remember she says, Oh my God. She said, and she actually said, Is it, uh, is it ever going to get better than that? I mean, what, how can this be in pro? <laughs> That's amazing. So, okay. You know, um, yes. Maybe more, uh, more, more good stories about about the cast. Uh, thoughts about now that we we we're gonna talk more about uh, David and Michael, of course. Thoughts about um, uh, April, and then you worked with with um, with Bonnie, you know, with Rebecca and Patric uh, uh, Patricia as well. Yeah, um, as I said, and uh, yeah, I mentioned this before. Yeah, I as I think most people were, we all had huge crushes on Patricia. You know, like she was. Yeah. We did. And, uh, you know, because she was a remarkably friendly. Now, here's something you should know that they know about the Knight Rider crew. It was one of the only crews for all the years, especially John, the, the cinematographer and the others. They were together for the entire group and they were a huge family. They used to hang out together. They'd go to each other's house and their birthday parties and their brisses and their baptisms and their July 4th. And they loved each other. And I have to be honest, some of them in some of the uh, areas were not the best in the world. But they were so dedicated. And so, and, and I got to say, David treated them like God. You know, he had gifts and things for them and always knew their birthdays. And they knew his and they, everyone that it, it, I realized, who cares? But I'll give you an example. I think it's a nightmare. Yeah, it was a nightmare was when... David goes to his old precinct. In it, there was a thing that says there was a sign that would say precinct, whatever, right? You know, that's like grass, whatever, you know, next to the next to the door. And yet you know, we have we have what's called a um, table conference before you do the show, and all the department heads and the producer and the director and everyone is there, and you go page by page. Okay, what's needed here in effects? What's needed here in stunts? What's needed here? In other, and then we get that. Okay, art director. Okay, that we're going to need a sign. What do you want? You want a brass? You want? You know, we want the okay. So, and I said, I'll make sure we we have a sign. I went to the location, and this is where we can put it. And the communication. When I went to the set, I looked up, and I don't know if you have those there, but instead of an old brass and grave signs as precinct. It was one of these for like you have for sale, you know, uh, you know, artichoke sixty seven cents. This big white banner, you know, for like you'd have in a supermarket. <laughs> it's pretty same so. <laughs> I don't know where the communication went off, you know. And I had to. So all we did is we took it off and we made sure not to shoot that. And I think we went back, you know, to get us an establishing shot later with the. So they would do stuff like that. But they were all, you know, wonderfully, uh, you know, good, good people. The reason I bring all that up is they adored Patricia. Yeah. 
and appreciate and you know and of course they adored and dem and and edward moliere who could be a great curmudgeon and i have a really good other curmudgeon story i've never told about him uh doing a very sweet thing and and of course david uh and so um as you know everyone was really shocked when the network and it was 100 percent the network that's our studio exec i mean our group uh, comes against it we fought against it david really fought against it but they said she's not pretty enough or she we need more you know hot babe what yeah you know, anything and you know and they so they brought in rebecca holden now rebecca is a perfectly nice person as i said to you one people we may not know because when you see her and she is she is what she is she is this very much like um you'd see on these reality shows of someone who was you know a model and you know into the clothing and rodeo drive and the right perfumes you know and going to all the big parties and all and nothing's wrong with that but that's a different kind of lifestyle but i will say about rebecca i i've been a cowboy and rodeo mostly for charities as i i've told you and um have horses all my life but i also got well um roy rogers taught me to shoot trap and and rodeo and i did a lot of trap events and i even as um was involved for 16 years this wonderful town uh, warsaw missouri and we were able to raise money to build a children's hospital for the people up in the ozarks up in the in the hills like in the show ozarks yeah, yeah. and the reason i mentioned all that was try for you people here try to picture this and I was I was in person to do this. One year I went there and all the celebrities came in. We had, you know, I won't even mention names, but you know them, all these wonderful people. Rebecca Harley and her husband shows up. And I'm thinking, oh, her husband's gonna hike. She gave me hunt. Now to do turkey hunting, you know, you have to get up at three in the morning and it's usually sometimes stormy and uh, you're in full camel gear and you gotta trudge through the mud into a forest and then you gotta put yourself down. If in in the forest, you know, against a tree and wait for hours because the birds are roosting or sleeping in the trees. And then when they come down, you call, I'm going to, but you make a call and they have to come to you. And, you know, it's a whole thing, but it's not glamorous at all. And there was at three in the morning, you know, they had, you know, some kind of breakfast and stuff for us before we went off, you know, way off into the hills. There's Rebecca and all of her gear. You know, so I give her, you know, and, and not doing it like, you know, oh, look at me, but really into it. So that was a side of her I didn't know. But unfortunately, um, it was very hard to write for her, you know, because if you're going to say, you know, the Doppler type bandwidth normalization is greater, the pulse modulator is, you know, uh, not working and we have to do sub, sub sync it into a you know, blah, blah, blah. Even you, you, know, you couldn't do it because, and nothing against her, but, you know, Patricia could rattle that stuff off. And most important, you believed that she knew what she was talking about. And even more important, that she, remember, she's supposed to be the one who invented that. And if, if you needed something new, she'd come in, she'd say, I know you're that. Listen, I just worked on this. I just fixed this. I just made this stop, blah, blah, blah. And um, everyone, yeah. And also, I don't know what they're talking about. I think she was a very sexy in a very, you know, intelligent, beautiful way, in a very natural way. Um, and nothing against Rebecca. She tried as hard as she could. I will say, and I'm not going to name names, but some, some of the other writer people on the show uh, were really so upset about Patricia that they purposely were writing some dialogue that was really a little tongue twister for poor Rebecca, you know? And so I didn't later. But the point is, is the other part of this, and again, I don't blame her. Of course, this is before emails or, you know, comments or anything, Instagram. This was, we had these things called letters that people wrote. And the network and a, a studio, especially the network, got tons of letters from people um, just hating Rebecca. And she's not someone to hate. No. I mean, she's job. not someone to hate. <laughs> no, she's a lovely person, yeah. but she's into that part, you know. And and she well, hey, they get cast her. She said, yeah, she did the best she could. It's not her fault. It's not like it's not like that uh, great um, movie All About Eve, no. you know, where the, she takes the part away from Betty, you know, Betty Davis, you know, no, 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 me. It wasn't that at all. She did her her thing, and it wasn't fair. But it was so there was such an outcry that, as you know, they brought Patricia back. And uh, for Patricia, I will say one other thing that I do remember. 
the, some other time, if you're ever going to do uh, anything about the bionic woman or the bionic, the, the six million dollar man, I could tell you uh, one a remarkable story, which I won't get into more detail, but it has to do with somebody um, getting fired and then getting revenge, you know, being begged to come back and really getting revenge. Patricia just came back and, you know, and I know it had to hurt her. And, you know, it has to, as I told you, when you're a so, I remember when she came back, uh, she was um, just like, you know, like reunion. It was like a high school reunion. Hey, everybody, hugs and happy. Yeah. Great to do the work. Let's get to work. And you could it's just, you could feel it in her. There, you know, there wasn't any of that. Because <laughs> yeah. that's every actor's fantasy. Yeah. Nobody comes back to an actor, uh, you know, on knees saying, we want you back. Please, we have to have you. You know, we made them. Women you know. But anyway, that. But the, today, Rebecca is a huge asset for the night rider hobby. Uh, she 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 attends conventions, and yes. it's is always very very positive in in her yeah in the in the, in the way she talks about the show and 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 promotes the show still. So so uh, yeah, I did that. I I consider her a, a good friend of mine. I I interviewed her at Atlanta last year. That she's a oh, fantastic lady. Well, I got to know her pretty well on these. Uh, these I didn't know her at all uh, on the show, but afterwards, and as I said, you know, as Patricia was um, came back that way, I did when I ran into Rebecca not that long after when she was doing these charities, and I also did some conventions. It was one in Vegas that she was at. Well, the, the other side was true in a very positive way, as you say. She was there. She did her two seasons or once, I guess, two seasons. And uh, she was thrilled. She never saw because she knew it wasn't her fault. She knew it was anything bad. And it wasn't anyone didn't like her. Yeah. It was just they they wanted this, you know, this other kind of glamour, over which a person who was supposed to be a techie, you know, in in America's mind, uh, you know, is that's not the look you want, you know, you know, for that kind of you can't. She could be Charlie's angel. She couldn't do it. But to her credit. I, I, you're absolutely right. Now, I've gone to conventions, and uh, you know, she, and 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 what's you know, it's ironic now. People in Maine were just seeing her. Yeah, yeah. You know, they love her. You know, and she still looks great. Yeah, you know, is L two. Um, and I'm not saying that she's older, but that was a while ago. She looks fabulous, and and it's all a kind of natural looks as well. It looks, looks good, but you know, um, so that was an ironic, isn't it? That uh, you know. And, you know, afterwards, when we talked, I didn't know when I first saw her after that. She was just so happy. Oh, and and she, I guess she was involved in, you know, she already got involved in lots of other stuff. And anyway, but those are, because, you know, in our business, there are people who hold grudges yeah. to the. Yeah. yeah. So, um, um, were you also involved in the, in the season four with the RC3 Super Pursuit mode? Um, not as much. Uh. I, uh, it's interesting. I don't know if it was in the first season, or the last season, the, um, I was trying to look to see which, it, the, which, which episode, oh, which, which episode it was, um, oh, um, oh, I think a final verdict. Now, final verdict was in the beginning of the third season. Isn't that correct? The final, final verdict was uh, in the first season. Right. Because <laughs> in final verdict, um, in the third season, there was an episode where I got a, I, I worked on I worked on I produced a lot of those shows too. But I was also working on another show at the time. Uh, wasn't as involved, and um, but it's interesting because there was a show there that I wrote that I get crow with Janice Hindler, which has to do with someone who I guess gets a poison and then got to find a uh, dead of night. Yeah, yeah. dead of night. Yeah. yeah, which I titled dead of night. Well, the reason it was called Dead of Night was uh, uh, I always loved Edward O'Brien made a film noir uh, movie back in the 50s, which I used to see as a little kid. You rarely saw it. It was called DOA. And the idea was it's a brilliant opening. You see him like in a film noir walking down downtown L.A. through the credits. He's going and going, gets off a bus and goes, he ends up in a police station. And he goes to the, uh, you know, got the guy, can I help you? I need to see a detective. And he goes, oh, all right. So, and he goes into a room and the guy comes in. He goes, yeah. He says, I, he says, I need to report a murder. And the guy goes, yeah. All right. And takes a piece of, yeah, in the old days, take a piece of paper, puts in the typewriter. What's your name? And I says, 
Okay, and who was murdered? He says, me. And that's how it opened. Isn't that great opening? Yeah. Turns out that he's been, uh, he knows he's been poisoned, and he only has 24 or 48 hours to live, and he's going to try to find out the person who killed, who murdered him yeah. before he dies. And so I took that, and we made that into Dead of Night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so that was one that I work on. Now, another quick side story. I, after Night Rider, I went to Disney and I was there for quite a while. And one of the things I did was my miniseries Western. And that's where, you know, I get, Meg Ryan got her first start. And I saw, uh, you know, the long story I went to, she was just wonderful. But I stayed at Disney. And when I get, when she got, when I cast her in the part, I told her it was amazing. The CEO of Disney, of the entire thing, was Ed, was Michael Eisner, who was involved in everything. He read all the scripts, he looked at daily, plus, you know, all the news, everything, the entire empire of Disney. I don't know how he did it. And we're actually at his house looking at um, uh, different, and we, they did screen tests of actresses for the part that she ended up playing. She didn't have a screen test. She was in New York. She did a, um, well, uh, she was sitting in her agent's office. She sat on a stool and told some jokes in old style video, you know, and we put it on his screen. I said, that's it. And then I turned to him and I said, uh, and not only is she do that, but you better put her on contract because she's going to be a big star and do some movies. And so one of the movies that I I just suggested, it, but I didn't have any part of the movie, was they did a remake of DOA. <laughs> and uh, it was funny because I was someone there when I mentioned it, then to the movie, they said, wasn't that a night ride in life? Awesome. <laughs> They have also, one of my other favorite movies was uh, Fantastic Voyage. And after that, I said, you should do a remake of Fantastic Voyage, which they, they did called Inner Space. And the only thing I feel bad about was because she co-starred in Dennis Quaid in both of those, they got married. And that was not the best marriage in the world at the end. But she's, you know, a trillionaire now, happy, got her kids, and she's doing great. But anyway, but yeah, that was that. But yeah, I was involved in some of those. One interesting thing about, which I think was in... Fourth or third, I, I don't know anymore. Kit Ferris's car, the with its because uh, now originally, and I have his name, um, who did the voice of Car originally, who then went on to do all the Transformers. Yeah, yeah. who was made a career of that. For some reason, when this was so exciting for me, yeah, it's funny because you, I work with all these major stars and directors and all these and you know and, and, and it's wonderful but you don't go <laughs> but every once in a while that there's these certain people like when Roy Rogers called me you know and I yeah I was like yeah I couldn't even talk you know be with and the other person I felt that way was you know who did the voice for Kid versus Car who did Car yeah it was Peter Collin no not the first not the second one okay do threes okay and three and Paul Freed, as you might know, okay. is voice of everything at Disney. You know, he's a, he is a, you know you you hear that voice, you know that wonderful voice in the in the haunted mansion, in Pirates of the Caribbean, and yeah, in Inner City and all the other stuff. Um, yeah, and and in movies and TV and Paul and Paul Freed is terrifying because I went to the, there was an actor we did a show and he was known to do this and he yeah, he died tragically during the series near the end. And Paul Fries was the kind of person, now that you do it with AI, but he, he can come in, hear this, you know, listen for a while to the voice, and then ADR the guy's voice exactly. Awesome. But, um, yeah, Paul Fries was, in fact, Paul Fries at one time could have been the voice of Kit, which is ironic. And you also know, here's another interesting little point. When they originally asked William Daniels if he would do the voice, you know, the evil twin, he said um, in so many words that he felt it was disrespectful to Kit, and he wouldn't. He didn't. It's cool. I don't know if he, you know, and he's great, but you know, I, it was I guess smart to use someone else. For example, what um, Michael didn't even, um, um, David didn't know originally when he was Garth, when he was his evil twin. You know, they dubbed his voice. I don't know if you know that. Y'all had a No. Yeah, but he thought. He kept thinking, you know, boy, that way well, I did a good job there, you know, but they really wanted a different voice. So they put a different voice in. But yeah, so, but my point is, is that I was in ADR when, and I knew what he looked like. No one knows who Paul Fries. He's only done very little on camera, but he did a lot of things with Stan Freeberg and others, and, and lots and lots of cartoons. Like, he was like the other Mel Blaine, you know. Like, 
<laughs> so, so when the, in, d- d- during the show, were, were there any talks and thoughts about evolving the character of Michael Knight, uh, making him him do new things? To, uh... Yeah, that, there's a couple things to that. One of them is Mouth of the Snake, I think it was called, and that is a disaster. And I feel sorry because it was written. It, they were told that a character named Dalton, and they were talking about maybe doing a spinoff yeah. series. Code of Vengeance. Yeah, yeah. and um, uh, but originally Robert uh, Foster and Rob Gilmore wrote a wonderful script, and um, then they 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 took that script, if I remember, or at least the story, and they said, "Oh, we're going to make this into also a spinoff for Dalton," and they didn't quite know what it was going to be. But if you remember in that show, it got to a point they kept changing it and they kept rewriting it, and the, 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 you know, for then they Robert and then. Rob are some of the most professional, excellent writers I've ever known, and perfectionists. I mean, they they really care about their work, and it was really I remember kind of upsetting because they you know they had to keep changing, and then they say hey if, if you if you tell us what you want or what this is be, but they didn't know, and so they're like writing you know and without having you know it's like being in a in a you know a plane without a pilot, yeah. you know, and so they're trying to pilot. it. And as you know, you hardly see Kit or Michael in that show. Yeah. And um, and to Michael's credit, though, I think I could be wrong. It was about the time he either just got married or he was going to get married. Yeah, I, I've heard that as well. That that, that he was actually doing it around his honeymoon or something like that. Yeah, but uh, as a matter of fact, his marriage is very funny. He's such a nice guy. There was a Universal was really pushing their walk, you know, to have Universal Studios and expanding, expanding it not, not to the not to the point it is now, but and a um, restaurant chain called Fuddruckers got in there, and they really wanted to have something to really push it. And I guess he was either friends with one of the Fuddrucker or the person was taking it over. So he half kiddingly said, "We're well, getting married." He says, "Why don't you get married here at Fuddruckers?" He says, "Well, we'll be on TV, and we, you know, and uh, we'll pay for everything." And it wasn't that he's cheating, it was just that, you know, sometimes Michael is such a, uh, Michael, <laughs> David is such a great guy, that he just thought, okay, I'll help him out. And we all went to Fuddruckers for it. And the priest actually says, do you own David Hasselhoff? We are in Fuddruckers. And he was so stupid. But it was mad. And he literally said, that William Daniels is sitting next to me, and he looks at me, he goes, so, where's our, who's going to sponsor the honeymoon? McDonald's? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, it was very fun. As you know, too, I've been to many conventions and sh- they get along well now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and uh, they're, they're, you know, really good. He's, uh, I have to say something about David. Um, you know, he has got that one thing about him. He, 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 you know, I really don't know if I've met anyone who's not only is professional and decent. And I said to him in a very good way, I said, think of, David is your favorite eight-year-old. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that he is somebody who has, he's an innocence about him, uh, is a trusting, he's an incredibly professional. And um, one thing I don't know if I ever mentioned, was you said, when I first got on the show, I had heard rumors, all turned out to be false, that he was hard to work with, that he came on the set drunk and all, which is total bullshit. But, um, I can say that word. But anyway, <laughs> Um, oh, not gonna edit that out. <laughs> yes, podcast. I can say that, but it is. Um, you know, as I said, he was wonderful. Um, but I was concerned. I I didn't know David that well, and um, so this is a funny story, and, and it's fine. David loves to repeat the story also. That he came to my office to see me. You know, when I, I just started on the show. Uh, he had just, he had read night he loved night nightmares you know oh my god I'm actually going to do something and you know and I told him I'm going to beef him up and I'm, and he walks in but what I had done I had just done you know and I looked around like my secretary or assistant as we say now or my assistant said you know he's going he, he wants to come in and see you whatever noon and I'm looking around and I see a, a script for some reason on the shelf it was an, it was a night a magnum script I'd written. And I quickly said to my assistant, I said, well, I want you to make me up a very official title page on the Knight Rider, you know, title page for the script. And it's called The Death of Michael Knight. 
you know, by Tom Green and I want, you know, a production number and a day and all this. And I said, you know, and she did, she printed it out. In those days, we didn't have printer. You know, she had to go to, with there was one, this is true, at Universal, there was one Xerox machine under the commissary. And you had to get permission to use it. I am not making this up. She ran down to the commissary, you know, and, and you had to have a special code to use it, made a copy of it and ran back just in time for me to put it on top of the Magnum script. And I put it on my desk, turned around and put the chair in front of it for David. And David came in and sat down and we're starting to talk. And I kind of did things like, you know, I had my fingers and hands, you know, kind of move, so kind of get his. So finally he starts to look at it. And at first looking, we're talking and, and, you know, it's just nice talk and looking down and looking, looking. And then finally he takes it and picks it up. He looks around. And he goes, oh, what's this? I said, well, we always like to have a, a an emergency script. And I said, listen, I'm just going to be upfront. If you come to the set, you know, uh, and you're not prepared or you run off with some, you know, fluency to, you know, the Bahamas for the rest of your life, I need to cover myself. I said, so I have this script ready to go. Now, what's so funny is he's concerned he picks up the script he starts th th throw it but you know why are they not reading because it's a magnum script there's no way that you know, he sees it but what he sees it's the whole script well you know the whole script back and to his credit he goes mm. he stood up puts it down goes to my door and does the old michael knight yeah <laughs> you know and uh you know he took it in like you're right and, and he behaved. He was, you know, he, well, he behaved. He did what he always did. He was always terrific. But it's funny because I've heard he loves to tell that story about, he was, you know, the producer, he wrote a script to kill me off if I didn't. You know. <laughs> but yeah, but that was, um, um, yeah. And he, uh, as you know, uh, I mentioned this before, but it, it is important about him. Their Wish Upon a Star, I think it's called, was not in existence back then. Well, we would get letters every once in a while, you know, because of our shows. And it would be a mother saying, my son is dying. Is there any way his wish is to meet with so-and-so or whatever? And, you know, it, it, and there's some stories I can't, I won't tell you now, but for only one actor who was horrible about it, we won't go into it. But this happened, of course, on Night Rider a lot. And it's unbelievable. And there's no publicity on this, but I could talk about it now. It's he wouldn't. He re he was very mad. No photography, no publicity. I don't know anything about it. But if that happened, and we especially remember one specifically, and this boy, this was oh, his whole life was night rider, and he had all the night, and they lived in Ohio or something. On his own, David paid for them to come to come here, put them up. We had a Universal Sheridan Hotel, which was you know right there in the studio. Put them up there. He came in for the day. He had a night rider with his name on a night rider jacket for him and all you know, all the you know, Geno's lot. And you probably have a night rider memorabilia. He had the whole cast of crew there. And we did a scene with him in the car. I get really cheery eyed with him and Michael. And he had had William Daniels pre record, but let's say the kid's name was Billy. Hello, you know, hello, Billy. It's nice to meet you. Are you going to meet her? You're not going to let Billy drive, are you? You know, and he's just like, <laughs> And they drove in the back lot, and there's a back um, huge parking lot, which in those days, and it's called the Barham lot, which wasn't used. And he did all of these screams, and th you know, and he did it himself. And the kids, ah! and of course, let him get in himself. And then on the set, we didn't really shoot the scene. And I wish we had video, we could do it, but we actually had, did as if we shot a scene with him in it. And he went to lunch, and other actors from other things came to him, and. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was just an amazing thing. And then about a month or two later, you know, his mother called wrote and just said, you have no idea, you know, he or more than that, he was only supposed to be around for like two more months. He stayed, he lived for like eight more months. Always happy. He's just passed away and we buried him in his night writer jacket. You know, they get really emotional. And David was crying. But that's the kind and you know, that's the kind of person David was. Yeah. And you, know, you worked on a lot of other shows as well. And um, were there any, if, if, if you should single out one or two things that, that made Night Rider different um, uh, compared to a lot of other things you worked on? Are, are there I would say, yeah, I would say the main thing was um, 
after having come off of three and a half years of Belisario, masterfully brilliant shows. I would, if you ever get these, these, you know, there are two things that, that I've done in my life that I would say, someone always say, what would you show people? What are you most proud of? Well, the main thing I'm really proud of is the thing I just finished about my life called Little Victories, but that's not done yet, but they would be um, the producing and doing Tales of the Gold Monkey. And there's some episodes of that. And of course, uh, um, Wild Side, which was my miniseries Western, because my father wrote Western novels and is actually in the Hall of Fame in Oklahoma, which has a National Cowboy Association, you know, museum. Those I'm very, very proud of. But uh, my point is that the work uh, that I did for those years, especially on the last thing I had done with Gold Monkey, was 24 hours a day. And I really wanted it to be the best. The reason I mention all that was that at first, as I told you, I'm thinking, you know, even though it's an writer, it's a 24 hours a day. And I had a girlfriend who I for many years, uh, and actually she, she played, she was wonderful. She played uh, um, the, the um, uh, I, you know, in every Western, you always have a mortician. It's always a tall, a lanky guy who looks after it. Yeah. Well, she had at, she she had been actually a prima ballerina at and New York Ballet Company. She was the original. There was a commercial for Irish Spring Soap where the girl says, "It's a manly soap, but I like it too." She was an Irish. She had red hair. She was a real red hair. She was like Sally Field. You know, she was this crooky, wonderful person, and I made her the Undertaker. And you say, die, it's not so bad. Better a sharp stick in the eye. You know, it was complete all she full of life. Anyway, and the reason I mentioned that was is that um um she uh and that was the after I lost my Greek girlfriend because of the Lazario to when I got her. And Marini just and really I you know, Frank, I I actually always have things for Irish girls. I don't know why I just I've had I almost married her I had two other real Irish girls. Well, I've saved my life, as a matter of fact. Well, my point of all that was I kind of wanted not to lose her in another show. Now, she was an actress, and she worked all the time. She was on a series called Hotel. She did a lot of stuff, a lot of theater. Uh, she did choreography. But this can eat you up, and after a while, it gets to be too much. And even though you could be the most even-minded, nice person, it also gets you on edge at times. And... um the best thing about the whole point of this was that Knight Rider, we, you know, there were these little funny things that happened, but it was such a romp. It was such a joy. It was easy to write. Uh, you know, we were able to do some fun things. We were dealing, as I said, this crew, you know, it's a job where we're like, you know, every day was it, was, you know, and they always are doing parties, birthday parties for people or, you know, bring people, bring some kinds of food or we would, they were playing games. You see, I think about David Hasselhoff, he got, it didn't lose a lot of money, but he got involved in all these, he couldn't say no to friends who would have, I have an idea for a, a frisbee that has a twirling on it or a gloves that has a, you know, you know, and he put money into it and then he'd end up with a whole group of all the, so we put him to the whole crew, right? And so we'd be out playing. And one fun thing is he had a, a ball it was like um, a baseball. I forget what it was. There's something different about it. And, um, you know, and to me, the you know, we talked about the show Leave it to Beaver. Well, that street it'd be that they lived on, and in the opening of every show, you see them walking down the street. That's a set. And, you know, it's a whole set street, which is still there. And we used to love to run out there and go right in front of the Beaver house and play ball. And he, he had a certain kind of hula hoop and do all these things, you know. He brought us back to childhood. And, you know, you, it was, the pressure was there. You had to do a show every week. It had to be there. And I do have a story I could tell you where we almost won one of the, the only huge horror on any show, which could happen. It actually happened to Glenn Larson a couple of times earlier on, is you don't make a deadline. Yeah. Because you have to make a deadline. And that means they have to put in a rerun. The studio has to reimburse all the money. There's all fine. It's a it's a disaster. We almost almost had that happen. Now on a Belisario show, that would never happen. Because what Belisario would do is if he was going to get scheduled, he didn't care. He told the network, okay, we're shooting on a Saturday, which was golden time and meal penalty and all that. And they go, Yeah, no, no, we're not just, you know, F you. And I I'm doing it goodbye, which I loved about him. But anyway, um, you know, we never had that except for once, which Edward Mollier saved us, which I could tell that story, but 
Um, yeah, that was the story in New Mexico. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, what, my, um, I was, uh, um, you know, uh, talking and I've talked to David and other, because I also, uh, I worked, I, I worked behind the scenes somewhat with um, Doug Schwartz, what David was doing Baywatch, but then I ended up doing the whole season, which was, that was incredibly fun, of uh, Thundered Paradise in Florida with Hulk Hogan and Chris Lemon and Patrick McNee, another huge, I mean, he was my hero, they're only working with Patrick McNee, you know, from the from the Avengers. But my point is, is that um, I, I, Dave and I stayed really close friends, and, you know, he talked, too, about Baywatch is the same thing. I didn't really work that much on it, but um, he had the same response about Knight Rider, which was... You know, it was a romp, yeah. you know. And the other thing is, is nobody, they watch, I guess, because that had all the babes and stuff. Well, that went on for like a million years and, yeah. you know, a huge success. And I have to say that the the Doug Schwartz, especially, was an absolute genius who put that together. And David was really fun. But and I have to say something about David. You know, he was good about his money, I will say, even though he would do these silly things. Because we he used to love to... Um, we would have lunch at, I forget, it was a the famous restaurant in Beverly Hills, Beverly something, uh, the one with the palm trees on the walls that you see. It's it's the one you see in all the movies, and he liked going there. And between Knight Rider and Baywatch, it was a little bit of a time, and everyone said, it's over. Oh, you had a little bit, we'll get over. And, you know, and I said to I said, David, I said, you have that something, and you know. And I used to say it was funny. I say you could stand a lot on the beach, <laughs> you know, uh, playing volleyball with yourself, and people watch it. Isn't that funny? That used to be my, thing. and because nothing to do with him getting Baywatch or doing Baywatch, but um, he used to say the same thing. So I will say that um, the only thing that it was different on a lot of my other shows, especially Wild Side. Um, one thing that you, it's interesting you guys should know is when you do a show, even if you do a show for many, many years, you you are our family because you you see more of the people there than your own family, literally. But sadly, when the show finally ends, everyone goes their separate ways. And in many cases, you never see these people again, unless, of course, in this business, you do something together. Like I, I recast like Alexa Hamilton, for example. Who did a brilliant job in uh, Gold Monkey was in Knight Rider. Yeah, you know, or you put some others in like that. Like, what's your name um, from Magnum? But. Um, yeah, uh, you know the only thing I I really had some wonderful friends uh, during the time of night where we used to go out to plays together. There was a steakhouse near there called the Barley Stone. You know, maybe twice a week. You know, a whole bunch of us after work. You know, we'd all go off to, and it was a place where you choose your steak. You know, in in a thing, and then they cook the steak for you, and and we all loved that. And uh, so, um, you know, that that didn't be, but that was that's, and I. I will say that I think that I know for a fact that on shows that are like that, um, it comes off. You know, it comes off on the show and people see it. Ironically, did you know that in movies, most of the time, if people are on a show where everyone is having the greatest party time in the world, the movie bombs. <laughs> it's a terrible movie. When they're like ready to kill themselves or actually get into fistfights, which happen and they hate it, it's worse. That's the greatest film ever. Isn't that yeah, it was the opposite. Let's just end our conversation on that note today. And I hope you enjoyed this part two of uh, my interview with the uh, Night Rider producer, writer Tom Green. We will be back uh, in a, uh, part three. Uh, where we'll go more in depth on uh, some of the stunts, uh, and and we'll get more great stories from from Tom regarding his time on Night Rider. See you. <laughs>